Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message this morning is The Blessing of the First. You know, there are principles in the Scripture that run through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they stand true through the ages. Today we're going to deal with one of the most important, possibly the most important of those principles, and it's the principle of the first fruits. I want to explain to you what that means today. You've probably heard the term before. You may not know what it means. And some of you may be thinking already, here goes the pastor again talking about tithing, trying to get us to give money to the church. Uh, but I hope you'll put that out of your minds and hearts today. And I'd like for you to listen and listen to this, this principle about the blessing of the first. And, it, and please know that this is way beyond simply throwing some change or putting a few dollars in the offering plate. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I'll read these scriptures to you this morning. And I want to point out several things to you about tithing today that all Christians should know. The first point is this. When God is first everything else falls into order. That works with every part of your life. Not just with your money, not just with tithing, but total life stewardship. When God is first, everything else falls into order. Now, in the beginning we had Adam and Eve, and, and Adam and Eve had two sons. Uh, they had Cain and Abel. And in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 4, the scripture says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor upon Abel, and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Let's go to, let's go to verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if, you do not, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must master it. Have you ever wondered why God rejected Cain's offering, but he accept, accepted Abel's offering? You know, it's right here in Scripture. Cain, and the Scripture tells us, in the course of time, interesting terminology here. It makes you wonder if Cain just waited until all the rest of his bills were paid or until he had taken care of all his different affairs and in the course of time he brought an offering. He brought an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and right away Right here, he gave the firstborn. You know, he didn't know if there was going to be more, but he sacrificed the firstborn to the Lord. He gave to God first, it belonged to the Lord. So the difference between the two gifts, one brought the firstborn, one brought some things. There's a big difference right there. Exodus chapter 13 verse 2 tells us, the scripture said, Sanctify to me all the firstborn males, whatever is first to open the womb among the Israelites, both of God and of beast is mine. The Lord's words. This is a universal principle that runs through all scripture. If the principle of the first is practice, if God is first in your life, 
everything else will fall into place. Now you might say, well, that's just an oversimplification. You have no idea how complicated my life is. You have no idea, Paul, how complicated my situation is. You have no idea how complicated my, my financial situation is or my family situation. Let me say it again. When we put God first in our life, everything else will fall into place. The first is the Lord's. Now look down at Exodus chapter 13, verse 13, if you want to turn there and follow with me. I read first verse 2, and verse 13 says this, Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Now there's some explanation here. If you don't redeem the unclean with the clean, you're going to lose it anyway. <laughs> I have a friend, that, an older friend. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. His name was Aaron. That's who my son Aaron is named after. Aaron was in his 80s. He believed in tithing. And he used to have a statement. God is going to get his tithe. He's going to because it belongs to him. The necks of the unclean had to be broken of these donkeys. The, the first portion redeems the rest and it blesses the rest. Let me ask you this question. If God came and he stood in this pulpit or he came to your house and he said this, hey, let's, he, 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 let's make a deal here. If you trust me enough to bring me the first 10% of all you have, I will pour provision on you like you won't believe and I'll keep the devil from destroying you and your family you can trust me on that you can even put me to the test on that would you believe him if he said that well turn in your Bibles to the last book of the Bible Malachi chapter 3 Malachi chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 says this Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test, there it is. God's challenging people. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be a room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. I want you to hear closely what I'm about to say here. This is not prosperity gospel. There's a lot of prosperity gospel preachers on TV. I heard one the other night as I was flipping through the channels. You know, we men need a channel that automatically flips through the channels. We don't even want to bother with the remote. We just need to turn the channel, whatever, and it just flips through the channels. But I stopped long enough to hear this man just teach, preach some heresy that everybody needed to give to him. And then God was going to bless them. They're the seed faith heresy. The prosperity gospel heresy. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel right here. This scripture is merely employing the principle of first fruits. If you write things down in your Bible. And remember, whatever you write in your Bible, someday someone else is going to read. Your grandchildren may read the things you write down in your Bible someday. If, you're going, if you write things down, write this down. We don't tithe to receive a blessing. We tithe to be a blessing. You've got two choices when it comes to the tithe. You can either bring it to the storehouse, meaning the church, or you can steal it. That's it. You've got, you've got two choices with tithing. You either give it or you steal it. You pay it or you steal it. Because you see, the Lord has already told us that the first fruits are His. The first fruits belong to Him. So if we don't return them to Him, we are stealing from Him. Suppose my house was going to be remodeled and my, my family couldn't live in it for a month or so. And let's suppose that you and your family were going on an extended vacation for a month. And I asked you if we could use your house while you were gone, and you graciously said yes. And you gave me the keys to your house. So a month passes by, our house is finished, 
And my family uh, returns from, from our trip. And then you come to my house, which has been remodeled, to pick up the keys to your house, which I have stayed in for a month. And let's say that I say to you, hey, dear friend, my wife and I have decided that we want to give this house to you. So here are the keys. Enjoy. In other words, we want to give you the keys back to your house. Enjoy. You know, what? I mean, wait a minute. The house was yours in the first place, right? It never belonged to me. Giving you back the keys means that I am simply returning to you what was yours to begin with. And that's what many of us do concerning the tithe. We are given provision from the Lord over which we are to be stewards and then we act as if we own it. If we tithe 10% of it, sometimes people just treat it as if it's some magnanimous generous offering that we are giving to the Lord when we are merely giving to the Lord what is what? Rightfully and already His. Now the tithe already belongs to the Lord. Offerings are above and beyond the tithe. Well, not only when we put God's first, God first, everything falls into place. The tithe must be first. Jesus said that where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Now, as your pastor, and I, I would not do this, I don't think. <laughs> but what if, as your pastor, I asked you where your treasure is? Most of you would say, I'm sure that your treasure is in the church, your treasure is with the Lord. Then what if I ask you to prove it to me by showing me your bank statement? Do you tithe? Do you already give the Lord what is the Lord's? Do you, do, does your tithe come out of the first fruits, out of the, the first fruits of your income? <coughs> Suppose I contract, contracted with you to do a job for me, like repair my roof, and let's say we agreed on $1,000. You do the job, and then I pay you 10 $100 bills. How much is the tithe? Easy. A hundred dollars. Which hundred dollar bill is the tithe? Think about that. The first one you lay your hands on to spend. You don't buy groceries. You don't buy a new pair of shoes. You don't pay the electric bill. You don't do those things and then say, well, if there's a hundred dollars left over, then I'll pay my tithe. No. You tithe the first $100 bill, however you do it. How do you pay your bills? Do you pay cash? You know, you can, I'll talk about this in a minute, but you can pay your tithe here electronically, however you take care of your banking. The first fruit is the Lord. Now, we know, and I believe, that we do not have a legalistic God. He knows our hearts. Let's say that I forget to write a check or I forget and about my tithe for a moment and I write a check to pay a bill before my tithe is written. You know, God's not going to curse our income that month, but he knows my heart. He knows the motivation of my heart is to be a generous giver and to bring the tithe into the storehouse. So when God is first, everything else falls into place. Second, the tithe must be first. And listen to this. This is the big one for all of us. Tithing is a faith issue. It really is. The Bible tells us what is not of faith is sin. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we have to continually be taking steps of faith in our Christian life to please God. God wants his people to be people of faith. God does not want his people to be fat and happy over here, secure in the corner, doing nothing and having no faith for anything. God wants his people to be people of faith. Tithing is a faith issue. Let's be honest here. It takes faith to tithe. It can be a struggle. It takes faith to write a check and to, to the church and not knowing where the money is going to come from to pay the electric bill. But it's also a supernatural issue. It is a spiritually supernatural issue. 
It's the faith of giving the first 10% that allows God to bless the 90%. And God will bless the 90% 10 times over and bring more provision and blessings through that 90% than we ever could have done or would have done if we hoard the entire 100%. And God says, test me on this. God challenges his people, test me on this. I know a woman who talked about lean years she and her husband had after he lost a really good job. They moved on to other jobs, but they didn't make as much as they did before. They were barely able to pay rent and buy groceries. And one Christmas, her college daughters got their uh, favorite cereal for Christmas. Their favorite cereal box was wrapped up. That's all they could do. It was really a lean Christmas. Those were some lean years. And one Monday when she got her paycheck from her new job that didn't pay as much as the former job, she had a decision to make. She could either pay her tithe or pay her electric bill. And she very nervously wrote a check, a tithe check, and she gave it. And when she, when she left work that day, she hadn't told anybody about her dilemma. There was an envelope on her desk. She opened it, and inside was a check made out to her for $1,000. She remained faithful to the Lord with her tithe, and God always provided. And recently, she opened up an envelope, and there were three $1,000 money orders in it, and she had no idea who sent them. I want to read something to you. This is from our Zomi congregation that meets here. Brother Eddie, right over here, is the pastor. We at Zomi Baptist Church, a church within a church, at Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, 4930 Nolensville Road, held a meeting last Sunday, November 6th, and decided to contribute $1,000 toward the church's expenditures and to show our gratitude during this Thanksgiving season for letting us use the church facilities free of charge out of your love for the Lord. We would like to show our gratitude for taking us when we were almost homeless, having no viable place for worship, to welcome us as fellow Christians, for volunteers to take turns every Sunday morning to pick us up and take us to Sunday school and back. We can see the face of Jesus when everyone smiles with a genuine love for the love of Jesus Christ, our common Lord and Savior, Sincerely, Reverend Eddie Hong, pastor, signed by their church officers. Amen. Folks, <laughs> Brother Eddie, thank you for that meaningful letter. And thank you for the gift from the Zomi congregation. You see, they come here to Sunday school. How many of you are with Brother Eddie this morning, Zomi congregation? See, Brother Eddie comes and he brings the kids and the teenagers and then they come back at 3 o'clock for their worship in the Zomi language. Listen to me clearly. Folks, these people are immigrants who came to the United States with nothing. But they understand the principle. What's your excuse? I want to hear it. Okay? You'll have both ears. I want to hear what your excuse is. And bro Brother Eddie, God's going to bless your congregation because he said he would do it. Every time we get paid, it might be a battle. Jesus said we cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon was an, was an Arama Aramaic God of riches and pagans paid their money. To, to this Aramaic God called Mammon in order to be made rich. You see, we don't return to God what is rightfully His. Excuse me. We don't return to God what is rightfully His. We are paying it to Mammon. We think we will prosper more if we keep the 10%. Do you understand? If we don't give it to God and we keep it, we're just giving it to the... The Aramaic God, Mammon, thinking that we're going to manage it better than God can help us with the 90%. The bottom line is this. If you don't tithe, then you just really don't believe God. 
You see, we, we believe in what seems logical and natural to us, don't we? Not what God says he will do for us supernaturally. I know a pastor friend who challenged his congregation to tithe for one year. And if they were not satisfied at the end of the year, he personally would return that money to them. There was a church in White House, Tennessee, a few years ago that issued a similar statement. They challenged everybody in the church to tithe. And then after a particular period of time that they picked out, if you weren't satisfied, they would give you a full refund. Well, let me tell you, we're not going to do that right here. <laughs> but I'm convinced that this church can do anything we want to do if our people would tithe. And I told, uh, I believe it was on a Sunday night recently, folks, it's time we quit talking about all the people who've left us in the, pack and, uh, in the past and took their tithes and offerings with them. We've got to own it like it is now. We can't say what we used to do and how wonderful it used to be. Folks, we've got a lot of great stuff going on right here right now. We've got ministries happening in this church that did not happen when a thousand more people attended this church. And it's time for us to own it. It's time for us to look forward and not past. It's time for us to say, I believe what the Bible says about tithing and I'm going to begin tithing. And if you, if, you, if you continue to think, well, I just can't afford to do it, then you're never going to get it. That is not the point. The point is that you trust God with the 10%. You give him, you pay him what's already his. You trust him. He takes that and you trust him with the, the 90% as well. You know, in my life, I've never met a tither who regretted tithing. I've talked to a few people before they died who knew they were going to die and said, Brother Paul, I got some things I want you to tell my family after I die and I start writing these things down. You know, I've never had one person to ever say, boy, if I could go do it all over again, I would have never tithed. Never. I've had people say, boy, if I were doing it all over again, I would have given more. The sad fact is that if a church, our church, or any church is struggling financially, it's probably because members are not being faithful in the tithe. It's not the bank's fault. It's not the contractor's fault. God promises that if we bring the tithes into the storehouse, he will provide for us and protect us from the devourer. Let's keep in mind several things. In the Old Testament, God required the tithe. In the New Testament, God says this. One of many verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever, uh, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Generous people are happy people. Amen. Think about it. I don't think, probably you get like I do, the request to give to the Nashville Rescue Mission at Thanksgiving. I just can't imagine anybody writing out a check. Oh, I have to write this out every year to the Nashville Rescue Mission. <laughs> if that's your attitude about tithing, you are missing the point. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that may sound crazy to you, but it's what the scripture says. So on Prove the Tithe Sunday, here's your opportunity to start. You may think, I've never tithed and I'll never be able to make up for all the years that I have not tithed. You're missing the point. The point is to start right now, today, pay the tithe and trust God with the rest. Now, you may, you may feel led to give more than a tithe. Uh, I know a man because he shared with me privately, he gives 17% of his income. And he doesn't have any extra money. He's not walking around like a millionaire. Occasionally visitors will come into the church and they'll look all around and they'll walk through the building with me and they'll say, wow, you must have some rich people here at Tusculum Hills. So I haven't met any. <laughs> I haven't. 
And if, I mean, if you're wealthy in our congregation, you're sure, you're sure putting on a good act because I hadn't figured it out. <laughs> you know, the, 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 what we've got here in facility and ministries and staff and, 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 other, and benevolent giving and missions giving and, and all the ministries that are going on here at the church, it's, it's a widow's might that has been multiplied over and over and over and over. When I was in high school, I tithed from my meager income. I mowed yards, I worked at Walmart, I had a couple of typical high school jobs. I gave up my summers to work at a Christian youth camp. My friends at that time were buying used cars and I, I didn't have a car, I was, my dad let me drive his cars. Working at the summer camp was really a labor of love. We, we probably worked 100 hours a week. We got up at uh, staff meeting was at 7.30 in the morning. We went to bed around 11.30 or 12 every night. Uh, we received 30 or $35 a week for our own, just to pay for personal things. It was really just a labor of love. It, but the, one summer at the camp, I worked there for three summers. My second summer there, an older woman who worked as a cook at the camp gave me her car. She just said, I prayed about this and I'd like for you to have this old car of mine. It was really a gift from the Lord. And then I got a call from a clothing store in town when I came back home to Tennessee. Someone had purchased a, a gift certificate for me to buy clothes for school. All of those were gifts from the Lord. And I can tell you so many times that the Lord has just provided for us in miraculous ways ways and you could too if you're a tither you can share the same thing now with the tithe don't think of it as a tax if you do you're missing the point don't think of it as a franchise fee how can a person tithe well you can give cash you can write a check you can go to our church website and give online we have people that do that you can go to your online bank account and give. I, I want us soon to set up a kiosk here at church where, with a computer so people can give electronically because most people don't carry cash anymore. Most people don't write checks anymore. Let me talk to married couples right now. There's probably someone here who's married to someone who doesn't believe in the tithe. That could create a real dilemma in the marriage. If you both have a means of income and you have separate bank accounts, then tithe with your income. But don't allow your spouse's disdain from tithing to keep you from doing the right thing. And I realize this might be an uncomfortable discussion for a couple to have, but hey, you've probably had uncomfortable conversations before, right? If you've not had this conversation, then you need to have it. So I hope this sermon has hit a strong note with everyone today. God is faithful.